Okay, thanks everyone for sticking with us here today. Uh, I'd like uh, to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Raz Chavan, to present uh, technologies for nutrient removal in small or decentralized wastewater treatment plants. Dr. Chavan is a regional wastewater practice lead in the Pacific US with Stantec in Las Vegas, Nevada. His main areas of expertise include design and planning of wastewater treatment plants, especially for nutrient removal. Raj has also been involved in several bench, pilot, and full-scale studies, including functionality testing on various water and wastewater treatment process trends. In addition, he's been involved in several research projects, including innovative technologies, side stream treatment for nutrient removal, uh, DBP formation, disinfection byproduct formation, and their precursors. Uh, Dr. Chauvin, please go ahead. Thank you, Rick, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for attending this. Uh, today's talk, as Rick was mentioning, it's just looking at the uh, some technologies for nutrient removal. And as you know, most of them do apply for, for all small, medium, large size, but most of the technologies I will be talking will be applied uh, to small, small plants. Next, please. So today's agenda, as you can see, uh, pretty much what we are going to do is briefly go over nutrient and, and again, at high level, uh, uh, nutrient and what it does, um, what the biological treatment is, uh, nitrogen removal, phosphorus removal, and then specifically, I do want to go a bit in detail on the case studies that were um, design uh, constructed at the uh, small utilities and some key takeaways. Next, please. So plants, animals, and even microorganisms require nutrient in the correct balance to sustain life. Uh, some of these micronutrients are carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. In water, it is vital for these nutrients to be balanced and in the correct concentration to sustain aquatic life, such as fish, plants, or invertebrates. If this concentration of nutrients are not controlled, they lead to eutrophication, which is detrimental to receiving waters. Uh, next, please. Uh, as you can see, the eutrophication Purification is evident pretty much in every part of the world. It has touched each and everywhere in the world or the water bodies. Um, well, either removing or recovering these nutrients have uh, several benefits, such as you prevent eutrophication, pretty much uh, um, go, uh, detrimental of the water life. You prevent uh, ammonia toxicity to this fish and other aquatic life, prevent uh, public health, then you can also recover nitrogen, phosphorus for beneficial use such as fertilizers. So uh, next please. So just looking in general, now we go deep, uh, now we go into the wastewater. And again, I am trying to be high level, uh, assuming like most, most of you uh, uh, watching this presentation have, have been gone through this. So wastewater, as you can see, in wastewater or in a typical raw wastewater is made up of all these nitrogen species shown here. However, the majority of total nitrogen is present in the form of ammonia and organic nitrogen combined. And uh, typically it is called as TKN or total Kajal nitrogen. Can you go to the next please? So similar to uh, nitrogen, these are the phosphorus, uh, phosphorus sp species you see in wastewater. Uh, unlike nitrogen, phosphorus is in particulate form and also in soluble form. In soluble form, the reactive nitrogen and uh, the reactive phosphorus is of a special interest for us uh, because that's the main target we have to do uh, to remove. Uh, also, the main target is because it is really hard to remove uh, without biologically or having it precipitate to the particular form. Now, uh, next please. Now going into the uh, overall biological wastewater treatment, 
Okay. Uh, one, one more, please. So you, you can see that um, for any biological treatment, it uses a microorganism and reactor. So you have a reactor where you have a uh, where you have a biomass or microorganism. Uh, can, can you uh, press next? So the raw wastewater comes into the bio, uh, in a reactor or a bioreactor. Then the reaction occurs. Then you start producing the biomass. Uh, next, please. And then the treated water is gone. Then again, with the reaction, you do produce more biomass, which is recycled back into the systems to maintain a certain biomass. So this is just an overall, um, overall view of how the biological treatment works. Uh, next, please. Said that there are three different types of reactors, uh, suspended growth, uh, where the biomass is in suspension either due to aeration or mixers. Then you have an attached growth system where the biomass is grown on media, that is it is attached to some type of media, could be plastic or could be membranes. The last, which is a hybrid of both, in which you have both biomass is suspended as uh, the next one. Uh, uh, the hybrid, uh, can you push the next one, please? Uh, hybrid in which you have both biomass is suspended as well as attached to the media. Now, uh, as you can see here, one step further, you can have a different environment in the reactors. Uh, can you go back, please? Uh, different environment in reactors. You have aerobic zone where oxygen is present. Uh, typically two milligrams per liter, anoxic zone, nitrate are present, uh, where nitrate are present, uh, no DO or very low DO, typically you can say less than 0.3. And then you have a third zone, which is anaerobic, where you don't have any uh, uh, dissolved oxygen or any nitrate. The presence of this environment depends on which nutrient you are targeting. Example, if you are looking to take out nitrogen, combination of ox, uh, anoxic uh, and aerobic is used. If you are looking at BioP, then anaerobic and aerobic are used. Uh, next, please. So along with the environmental condition for design nutrient system, you do have to consider the shown environmental conditions like temperature, uh, which is critical, like low temperature impacts nitrification and overall microbial growth a high temperature impacts pre removal if it goes above 30 and, and other compounds which could be toxic to this biomass. Next, please. Also along with this environmental condition, you do have to look at the operational parameters shown here, uh, such as SRT, I mean solid retention time, uh, mainly depends on what you are trying to achieve, uh, beauty removal, nitrification, uh, and again, the SRT or solid retention time depends on um, your temperature, the size of the basin and several other factors. So you do have to consider all these parameters when you are designing and operating the nutrient removal system. Can you go to the next please? Uh, well, one more please. So, uh, when you are talking about uh, biological nitrogen removal, uh, as, I, as I described earlier, you do need two environments in the reactor, anoxic and aerobic. So shown configuration over here is uh, modified Lutzak Ettinger, which is MLE. It's a very commonly used for nitrogen removal. So you have anoxic zone for denitrification followed by aerobic for nitrification, you provide mixed liquor recycle for nitrate uh, to come back from the aerobic zone into the uh, anoxic zone for denitrification, then the depending on nitrogen removal required, you may be running short on carbon. So you have, or you may have to add the external carbon or supplemental carbon to take out this. Uh, can you go to the next one? So the another variation, uh, can you go to the next? Oh. Uh, another variation of MLE is the racetrack. Usually uh, in this type, uh, you 
instead of the diffusers or, or, or the um, fine diffusers or coarse diffusers, you do use surface aerators in this one. These are very easy to operate and can easily achieve less than 10 total nitrogen. Uh, next, please. Some of the other uh, configurations or some of the other treatment available for nitrogen removal are your extended aeration, uh, co contact stabilization, again, MLE, SVR, tickling filters, RBC. So however, these are not that most common. These are, are common in a package plant where the, the systems are very small, maybe less than 100,000, you can say, or, or even they go up to like 300,000 gallons per day. Um, next one. So the main operation consideration for removing, uh, can you go to the next one, please? Yep, thank you. Uh, so the main consideration you do have to give is, is SRT, as I mentioned earlier, make sure you have enough SRT for full nitrification so that you, you, you have enough nitrate that you can denitrify and get your nitrogen down. The temperature, uh, then pH, it has to be within, within the range uh, as during nitrification, the, uh, the pH or the alkanity is, is used, the pH could go down. Enough oxygen for nitrification. Uh, influent am ammonia, you do have to watch, uh, you try, not to have the slug loads, uh, then the carbon for denitrification, and you do have to pay attention on the side stream, especially where you have uh, anaerobic digester from where uh, huge or uh, almost 15 to 25 percent of your ammonia load could be coming into the system. Um, so this just provides you the high overview on how uh, uh, how the nitrification needs to be, uh, or the nitrogen removal needs to be looked at, uh, designed and, and operate. Can you go to the next one, please? Yep, thank you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you can remove phosphorus biologically or chemically, uh, or you can use the combined process. The biological, uh, the biological process is, is cheaper, uh, no chemicals are required and less sludge production. However, several factors do impact like carbon availability or VFA, you can say volatile fatty acids, proper environment for development of uh, phosphorus uh, accumulating organism and as a certain limitation achieving the effluent phosphorus. You can <coughs> achieve up to uh, less than one can be easily achieved, but as you go down, you do need to be combined uh, the processes. The chemical phosphorus is easy to implement. Uh, um, as you can see in this figure, uh, uh, it is a AO process commonly used uh, for uh, biological phosphorus removal only. Unlike MLE, in this, instead of uh, anoxic reactor, you have anaerobic reactor upstream of aerobic influent and RAS comes in anaerobic zone. P is released in, anaer uh, in anaerobic zone and then it is taken up in uh, uh, aerobic zone. Sometimes it is called uh, luxury uptake. Typically, uh, you can easily achieve one milligrams of phosphorus, however, depending on the process configuration in, in wastewater, characteristics or VFA available. There are plants which, are, which can achieve less than 0.5 milligram in secondary effluent. Can you go to the next please? Uh, then you have the other one uh, other than biological is uh, uh, chemical phosphorus removal. And it, it can be done by dosing the metal salts, uh, commonly used alum or iron salts at different location. It can be single point or multiple point. Again, the multiple point provides better uh, handle and control over removal and more efficiency than a single point. The typical uh, dosing locations are shown over here uh, in the schematic. 
you can have it upstream of primaries, uh, upstream of secondary clarifiers, or upstream of your tertiary filtration. Um, typically, to achieve uh, efficient or uh, uh, cost efficient uh, removal, you do combine biological and phosphorus removal. Uh, mainly, you do uh, remove as much as possible biologically and then polish that with your uh, polish that with your uh, chemical addition and, and tertiary filtration. Can you go to next, please? So you, we went through uh, how to achieve the nitrogen uh, separately, how to achieve phosphorus separately. Now, what we need to do is how we can achieve the combined nitrogen and phosphorus within the system. So shown ore is a very common process, which is A2O, that is anaerobic, anox anaerobic anoxic, and oxic a process in which uh, pretty much, if you see, it's, it's, it's a combination of MLE and AO process. So you have your uh, anaerobic zone followed by anoxic and then oxic. So in anaerobic, as we mentioned, biological phosphorus removal occurs, uh, then in, in the second zone, which is anoxic, the denitrification occurs. And then you have an ox, uh, oxic zone where the nitrification, BOD removal, and phosphorus uptake occurs. Goes to the clarifiers where the RAS or the return activated sludge for the biomass comes back into the system to maintain the biomass. So overall, and again, this is pretty commonly used in, in small plants, um, again, also, these are then this can be easy. Uh, this can be, or these are used in uh, mid-size or large-size plants. So, till now, what I was trying to get was was just a high-level, um, high-level look at nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, uh, biological, chemical, giving giving you a background for for the case studies. Uh, can you go to the next please? Uh, uh, one, one more, please. Yes. So, um, so with the case studies, I do want to spend some time and and go through a couple of a uh, uh, couple of plants where uh, where these uh, uh, configurations were applied and achieved the fluent requirement for the nitrogen. Uh, the first one is Mopa Valley Water Reclamation Facility. Can you can you go to the next one, please? So Moapa Valley is a small community. It is approximately 7,000 population. It's an unincorporated town in Clark County, Nevada, uh, located uh, in southern part of Nevada, approximately 60 miles to north of Las Vegas. Um, the old treatment facility, as you see in the picture, uh, is uh, was built in 1970s and 80s, included aerated ponds, secondary faculty ponds, and uh, um, infiltration and evaporation ponds, uh, and the approximate capacity was 0.35, uh, uh, 0.35 MGD. There was no any nutrient removal or reuse uh, done at this plant. Uh, all the effluent was infiltrated uh, into the ground or evaporated. Uh, can you go to the next one, please? So during 2000, the Las Vegas was booming and needed suburb. Uh, needed a suburb that can support uh, Las Vegas growth. So Moapa had a potential, um, therefore the population was growing there rapidly. Also several developers were planning, uh, so uh, were planning to, to develop quite a bit uh, development, housing development over there. So the plant was, was, so plant needed the expansion and along with them, along with that, they did got a lower nitrogen limit as shown in the, uh, uh, shown in the uh, table, they got total nitrogen of 10, going from zero to 10 was, was a big jump for them. So can you go to the next one? So to meet the objectives, uh, so to meet the objectives, new mechanical plant was, was designed, constructed and, 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 and started its operation in 2010. The new capacity of the plant was 0.75 MGD now. The treatment included headworks, uh, secondary treatment, rapid infiltration basin, solids were filled, 
um, solid lagoons where the solids were filled into the tubes and then allowed to dewater in the sludge lagoon. Uh, as they treated their effluent to a higher standard, they decided to reuse their effluent for wetlands. Uh, next, please. And just to give a high level, uh, this was a MLE process, MLE process with 12 zones. Um, and again, the first four zones were uh, uh, unaerated. In the next two, uh, five, six, nine, 10, 11 were swing zones and seven, eight, and two and 12 were, were uh, aerated zones. The primary effluent, there were some flexibilities. Primary effluent came into first, second, and third zone. So it provided uh, a decent flexibility. Also, the mixed liquor uh, could be taken to first uh, five zones. Again, the additional flexibility. The challenge over here was a long wastewater line coming to the plant um, and a sparse population, due to which there was pretty high variation in the flows. Also, at the same time, high variation in the BOD. Therefore, to achieve the total nitrogen, they had to use the external carbon source and they were spending uh, a decent amount, approximately like $25,000 on the external carbon. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is just the overview of the plant, uh, just showing uh, the uh, construction. Next, please. Uh, so they decided to do a proactive, uh, so they decided to be proactive and, and uh, went with the fermentation process in line to produce VFAs. Uh, they chose the uh, uh, zone three for uh, zone, zone three for removal, uh, for fermentation, and uh, uh, pretty much they turn off uh, the mixer over here, just one hour mixer was operating and they were able to produce decent amount of VFAs in line and were able to get rid of uh, external carbon. Can you go to the next one, please? Uh, just the, the, the results over here. Uh, on the left side, you can see when they were adding external carbon, it took some time for the microbes to acclimate. And then once they acclimated, the, and also the plant started producing enough oxygen, uh, enough VFAs, um, they started getting a, a consistently below six uh, total nitrogen. Uh, next, please. Uh, one more, please. So the second case study, uh, the second case study is uh, Donor Summit uh, uh, Public Utility uh, Department. Uh, the, the plant was uh, the plant was on IAT between Reno and uh, uh, between Reno and Sacramento. Uh, surface uh, the discharge was to the South Yuba River in winter and land irrigation in summer. Uh, next, please. So there were several problems before 2000. There was no ammonia limit. At two, in 2000, they got an ammonia limit. Uh, the plant was upgraded as a result. Uh, with IFS system. In 2008, the river did see the algal bloom. So in 2009, there were new permit in the area with a, with a pretty low ammonia and nitrate was added. Uh, so the plant went out of, uh, can you go to the next one? So the plant was out of, uh, out of compliance uh, due to the varying load and, and not uh, performance of the IFS system, as you can see. Uh, it's a, it's a um, ski area uh, resort uh, resort where very high variation in flows and BOD load. So it does impact quite a bit the plant uh, and, and was impacting for not meeting the uh, not meeting the nitrogen and ammonia limit. And you can see it gets pretty cold. Next please. Um, a thorough evaluation was performed, uh, looking at the different technologies and MBR was, was selected. Uh, next, please. Uh, some, some additional disposal options were evaluated, uh, including the previous. Uh, next, please. Uh, then the BioWin model was run to, to make sure that we will be achieving uh, the affluent goal. Um, can you, uh, next please. And interestingly, what we were, what we found was 
uh, most of the time or, or except one time the ammonia was within the limit except during the uh, during the start of the season and and we did evaluate it and was contributed that there were not enough nitrifiers during the startup and it took some time for nitrifiers to accum accumulate uh, acclimate the system and start nitrification can you go um, so can you go to the next please so to to I mean, to to overcome that we started adding ammonia and uh, ammonia throughout the year and were able to uh, and were able to bring that. Uh, can you go to the next one? Um, we were able to bring that uh, uh, ammonia down within within one, and mainly because there were nitrifiers throughout the system. Uh, means nitrifiers throughout the season, and there were not any uh, shocks during the startup or during the uh, uh, during the uh, ski uh, ski season. Can you go to the next one, please? Uh, just the low temperatures. Next, please. Very low temperature, as you can see. Therefore, the heat was added into the circulation just to make sure the temperatures are, are uh, uh, high enough for nitrification. Next, please. Uh, next, some some key takeaways. Uh, nutrient pollution is is problem. Uh, you need to understand what's there in your uh, what's there in your wastewater. Uh, BNR does offer a pretty good, um, uh, uh, pretty good solution for for your nutrients. Next, um, and again, um, you do have to uh, when when you are designing, you do have to make sure that you are looking at life cycle cost and not just the construction or OM cost. And especially in the small system, the resources are are very critical. You do have to find a good resources or your operators that can uh, that can make sure that you you can run your plant. Uh, next, please. So with this, I will take any questions you have. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Chavin. Uh, we have limited time for the Q and A um, right now, so. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it to two questions. Uh, first question from Michelle. Uh, how does economics and complexity of the different processes change as the plant size increases? So, so the, the best example is, is uh, mainly what you are trying to achieve, the effluent goals. Uh, if, you have a, if, you have, if you don't have the stringent limits, you can pretty much achieve with, with a pretty uh, simple, like for example, if you want to achieve nitrogen, uh, you, you can go with a pretty simple AO process, uh, whereas uh, most, and again, most of the plant, uh, large plants, they do have stringent limits, whereas most of the small plants, they don't have, at least till now, they don't have that stringent limit where uh, the, the, the economics works. Uh, you can, even you can just uh, uh, get away with, uh, with, uh, Pond system with with uh, making some changes into the pond system. Okay, thanks. And then uh, last question: um, When using chemical removal, will you see an increase in the metal coagulant that's used in the final effluent? Um, Yes, depending on what you are using and what's and how it impacts. For example, if you are using ferric and you have UV, you don't want to use ferric for, for phosphorus emol, you do want. But if you do have uh, tertiary filtration, uh, we at least we have not seen any coagulants into the effluent. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you again, Dr. Chauvin. Um, we're uh, going to be moving to our next session here. Please join us for the next session, side stream and mainstream deammonification for innovative nitrogen removal, uh, starting in about five minutes at 11.50. Thank you. Thank you.